From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi and welcome to another John Hannah Meets. My guest today is Catherine Cusack, who was on the show a week or two ago. And uh, you are the third or fourth member of the family I've interviewed. Oh. I interviewed Surika, oh, I think. Oh, did you? Great. Because she's had a cottage as yes. well on the Isle of Wight. Yes, yes, absolutely. And Neve, I've interviewed. Yeah. That was at the other Nuffield, the one on yeah. campus. Yep. And I think many years ago I interviewed Dad at Chichester. Did you? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So I love talking to... It's like a British theatre dynasty, isn't it, really? Um, um, Irish. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to say that. <laughs> I suppose, in a way, Catherine, there was no other career for you, was there? It's funny. I sometimes like to think of it as doctors or plumbers. You know, often <laughs> doctors, then their children go on to be doctors. It wasn't inevitable for me. I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a right drifter. I still am to some extent. So I went to university and decided to read drama just to test the waters rather than committing to drama school, which I was probably a bit terrified of that I wouldn't get in or whatever. So, But things happened and I got jobs and um, and one thing led to another and, and it was then that I sort of fell in love with it, if you like. Um, yeah. You mentioned plumber. <laughs> Sinead's <laughs> husband yes. was a plumber many years ago because Jeremy was born on the Isle of Wight. Uh, yes, I was. I'd forgotten that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he told me some lovely stories because he was a plumber for well, a while. He, he certainly did their loo in their first house, yes. I think. Yes. Yeah, which is quite... Yeah, I didn't know he was a plumber. For yes, me. and he used to go and sing outside of the cinemas in London with a guitar. Right, and yeah. He was a busker. Yeah, and he did Godspell and stuff. I know, the early wonderful, yeah, wasn't right. it? Yeah. Early on, you were a stage manager at a tricycle theatre. That's right. You? God, you've done your research. Very <laughs> impressed. Um, yeah, not even. I was an assistant stage manager. Yes. Yeah. In it, those that's days, a dog's body, isn't it? It, it is a dog's body. It's a runner. Yeah, really. Yes. Um, in those days, I mean, this was where I was very lucky. You, you could be in what's known as an acting ASM. So you were an ASM, and you might do a little bit. And that came with an equity card. And in those days, that was the, you know, that was the be all and end all. Mm. It's sort of a bit different now, I think. So that was what that was about. I think I would have been a good stage manager, actually, if I'd carried on. <laughs> <laughs> the hostages, that was... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you remember about that? Oh that was God. the first biggie for you. That was it? the first biggie. <laughs> yeah. There were a few things. I remember the lovely director, Nicholas Kent, saying, you can't act in theatre as if you were in, f in film. You need to, you need to reach a bit further. And this is ironic because now I can't seem to get any uh, auditions for films or telly at all. So maybe I've gone too, too far. But um, and I just the the main thing was, and I should have known, I should have been warned really, because I knew Dad and I, I'd hung about his rehearsals and his productions all my young life. But I completely fell in love with everyone in the cast in the Hostage, and when it ended. I was bereft, you know, because it was, it, w it was such a happy experience and everyone was so sweet to me and looked after me and I just went, well, these are now my family, you know, and so that was a kind of wake-up call that things begin and then they end. And you do hold on to people sometimes, yes. but often you can't. I bet you've been chased by fans and autographs because you were in Doctor Who early on. A little bit, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, was it the Blue Gang Leader? The Blue Kang Leader, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> I can't believe it, but that that story has become somewhat cultish, I think. I, I remember sort of being embarrassed by, by what I was doing in it, and I had a very weird line that I had to say send the cleaners to the cleaners, which haunts me to this day. But apparently people, yeah, were quite fond of it. And then Carmel, wasn't it? Yeah, Carmel Finnan. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like going into something as big as Coronation Street, really? Again, I think I was very young in myself, so I probably didn't realise the full, you know, which maybe protected me in a way. And um, it was a very nice experience. And again, people really looked out for me, you know. And they were very kind there. And it was all over in about six months or so. So, And then the kind of fallout happened. But, it, yeah, it was fine. I sort of blundered my way through it. And, yeah. You did The Chief, Bill, Jonathan yeah, Creek. Yeah, the usual. Yeah. Did you enjoy those sort of shows? I did. I think my natural home is theatre. I think maybe because 
I grew up around it. I, I Again, that thing of adopting these people as your sort of family for a while, um, I find that much easier and warmer you have a rehearsal process that you get to know people and you try stuff I probably find television a bit instant and I don't feel it's my yeah I don't quite know what I'm doing maybe but uh it was they were fine when you did doctors I think you've been about three different characters don't you? <laughs> yes. does that seem odd when you play somebody completely different um I sort of I leave it to them that they've left a long enough gap <laughs> so that people don't complain um it does it doesn't feel because there was quite a gap between them so you just come in and do the, the next job yeah. Frankie Sullivan of course oh bless her yeah, yeah. Belly Kiss Angel. That must have been fantastic yeah. for you because it was set in Ireland, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, it was heavenly. I, I, I loved that. Were I, you in the Garda in that? I was. Yeah, yeah. I was. I, gosh, I because who was the? I took over from Peter. Oh God, I forget his name now. From the previous guard, yeah, and um, they decided to make it a woman. They were stirring things up in Belly Kiss Angel. Did you have fun on set? I bet you did on and off set, I, I guess. I did, did I did. One of the things I'm most ashamed of, though, was that I still hadn't learnt how to drive. So for any shots where I'm getting out of a car or getting back into the guard a patrol car <laughs> um, or driving, I'm pushed out of shot oh. or into shot. <laughs> Oh, my God. I can drive now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they were very sweet to um, to do that. Finding Neverland, that was a movie, obviously, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, Spit on the cough in that one. Yeah, I think, it's, I, think I have Good Afternoon, Sir. I oh, think, really? To Johnny Depp, yeah, I say, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> was it nice working it with was, him? It was, actually, because the, there was a very long dinner scene, which is a nightmare for continuity, a nightmare. And I did it with a gorgeous actress called Carly Peacock, and we kept each other going, because we had to arrive at each place at the right time on the same line, but because the shots would keep changing. So sometimes you'd be ducking under cameras, over wires, under the next camera to get there in time and um there are also some kids now number one johnny depp kept the kids amused for hours because the the, the the scene took hours to shoot and then at the end he came up to myself and carly and said you had the hardest job of the whole scene and you were great and i thought that was lovely i was very impressed i know you said earlier you like the live stage and you've done quite a variety yeah. you did mill on the floss didn't you yeah i love that oh uh, did, did you see the production yeah you did yeah. oh i loved it too yeah helen edmondson did the adaptation and it was brilliant i think was anne marie yes yeah. i was in it with anne marie duff yeah. back in the day we oh. went on tour to india with it wow yeah that was an incredible experience that's the, when you're blessed yeah yeah the seagull i love the seagull yeah as well. well that brought me to the nuffield for the first time, up on the on campus, I um, would have seen that. We did it there, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. loved, I loved that. It was a very modern take on. Yeah, it. and Brighton Rock, obviously, completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. up in Leeds. I loved. Well, because I'm, I'm a big movie fan. a oh, big movie fan. So, to sort of, you know, that's it's a wonderful film. Richard Attenborough is completely brilliant. Do you like a lot of the old black and white movies? Yeah, yeah. I, I bang on to Anita about them. I've been watching The Third Man over and over again. Oh, yes. It's on telly. Um, and I just think it's one of the best films ever made. I recently had a birthday. My son gave me a, a, it was a box set of four John Mills movies. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, oh, what an actor he was. He was. Oh, my God, he could sort of turn his hand to anything. Yeah. And then for, when we were doing The Shadow Factory, I indulged in a bit of, I watched, um, oh, Mrs. Miniver. Um, yes. And uh, just to get in the mood. And um, and then Brief Encounter, which is later, I know, but I just love it so much. I went to his house at Denham Village ah. and, uh, you know, when I heard his voice and he walked in the room, I sort of tingled all over yes. because he's very charismatic. Very, man. absolutely, yeah. yeah. And King Lear, of course, you were in. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. That's one regret, if you like. I'd love to have done more Shakespeare and I've only done two. Um, but that was in Ireland with Jared Murphy, who was a wonderful actor. He's he's dead now, but playing Lear, and um, he was just wonderful. Yeah. One of my favourite all-time actors, Irish Richard Harris. I was oh, a great boy. fan of Richard Harris. Yeah, I think sometimes I get mixed up with who I've met. I yes. think I did meet him once in Dublin with Dad. Um, yes, I did because I remember him in a long white, very chic white sort of raincoat with his white hair. 
and he looked very thin, but absolutely still beautiful. I saw him at the Winter Gardens at Bournemouth mm. and in concert, and I went round backstage afterwards, and, and the stage door said, you know what he's like, he'll never sign anything at all. There were about nearly 100 people outside. He signed every autograph. Dude, that's wonderful. And I took up a Camelot CD or Camelot yes. vinyl it was then, and he said... And one or two others, he said, thank you for buying these, and oh. he signed them. Oh, I'm not Terrific. surprised. I, I've seen some interviews with him over the years. He seemed so his own man. He knew what success meant, and mm. he maybe had a bit too much of one thing or the other, but he knew wh- where it was, you know, and what was real, it seemed to me. He's a bit like Connery, a man's man, really. Yeah, I think yeah, men, maybe. I men like him because he was a bit of a rebel, but yeah. a brilliant actor, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, brilliant actor, absolutely. And, uh, Poetry reading is amazing. I haven't heard oh, that. I should yeah. have. You appeared with Sinead too in a production, did. didn't you? I did, yeah. That was, um, I was so happy to be part of that. It was basically her show. It, not a one-woman show, but she was dying of cancer throughout the show in bed and being visited by various people in her life. So I was playing her daughter, which was oh. strange. but And she was really, really wonderful because... <laughs> Halfway through, my mum got cancer. Oh. And I had to... Um, it, it became very serious. And Sinead, who had lost her mother, young as well, um, said, you know... Basically, she said, the show doesn't always have to go on. And it was like giving me permission to leave the show and someone else came in and replaced me and then I could be, be wow. where I needed to be. Do you have family gatherings very often or not really? Not... It, well, yeah, well, actually, we had one not the, uh, that long ago for a, for a 21st, and that was really nice. They, yeah, they happen now and again, <laughs> um, and we just sort of see each other in various combinations. Finally, what do you do right away, Catherine? How do you, what's your turn-off, really, from acting? Oh, to relax and... Yeah. Uh, God, well, it, I'll always watch films. Yes. Um, but I like... My husband is into climbing. He's introduced me to climbing, so right. actually... It go, I don't do intrepid outdoor stuff, but you have indoor climbing yes. pools. And they are a great way. Your brain just engages in what you're doing and you don't think about anything else. Really? I watched a sort of climbers going up these you yeah. know, vertical... Yeah. I don't know how they do it. You, you, know? you, just, you just begin. You did it as a kid. Everyone's done yes, it. You yes. know? It's just reconnecting with that. <laughs> and it's OK to be scared. You should be scared. Yeah. You know, it's... You always sort of walked on walls when you were a kid, didn't you? Someone yeah. held your hand and you walked along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so are you a sort of an ambitious person? Do you dream of big parts or you just want to work, really? I, I think I just want to work. Um, it's, you understand, yes. Um, yes. That's mostly, I think, what actors... Interesting work, that's what I'm ambitious for. It doesn't, yeah, that's the wonderful thing. All right, you're out of work, you don't know what's coming next, and then suddenly a Howard Brenton premiere lands... You know, mm. and and that's I didn't dream that that would happen. So that sort of thing is is very welcome. Yeah, we met recently at the NST City Theatre in Southampton, and yeah. of course, yeah. looking back, you did uh, the Shadow Factory. Yeah, happy memories of that. Yes, very happy, very happy. Um, it was uh, it was a uh, uh, quite a ride. <laughs> I'd say. Can I thank you so much for your time? <laughs> thank you. And I wish your career continued success. Thank you so much. Real pleasure. Thank you. Put that light out! I'm trying to relax and listen to John Hannum. Grateful thanks to Catherine Cusack. Early in the interview, we talked about Jeremy Irons being a plumber, and she seemed to be a wee bit surprised. So I thought it was rather appropriate to go back to an interview I did with Jeremy several years ago in London, talking about his early days before he was famous. <laughs> Another Hannum Archive. And I'm delighted to say my current guest was born on the Isle of Wight, and we're very proud of that fact. You wanted to become a vet, I think, Jeremy, for I a did. while. Hmm. Great friend of the family, a man called Dennis Danby, uh, was our family vet, looked after the horses, looked after the dogs, lived in Bembridge, had a, had a, a practice in London during the weekdays, looking after people's little dogs, and then would come down to the island at the weekend and look after people's larger dogs and horses and whatever and I thought that's a smashing sort of life because you get a bit of this and a bit of that and he seemed to do all right and he was very kind he gave me two books uh, Black's Veterinary Dictionary I remember which I still have and another book of veterinary practice 
And I was really quite into that until I realised that the training, I think, is about four years longer than that of a doctor and requires you to be quite good at sciences. And as I got older and discovered that science was not my bent, I, uh, I, I sort of forgot about that. But strangely, the life that I've made for myself is the life I wanted. I mean, I live in the country, I have horses and dogs, and um, so I got to it in a different route. You went to Sherbourne School, I know, after the Isle of Wight, didn't mm. you? You didn't pass too many A-levels, did you? Or? No, I don't <laughs> think I passed any. Didn't you? <laughs> uh, I'm, I got O-level passes, I think, on all my A-levels. Never been too good at learning for learning's sake. No one, sadly, taught me the love of learning for its own sake. And while I was taking my A-levels, I did a play, the first play I'd done at Sherbourne, and that took up my interest and my energies. And my A-levels were hopeless. I mean, my economics was one of the subjects, and I remember writing a letter on the exam paper to the examiner, uh, exhorting him not to make too much of a fuss about the fact that I actually didn't understand any of the questions, and please don't, you know, write to the school and say this boy has failed miserably, which of course he did, and I had to sit them again to no avail. When you left school, you really had no idea of your future, really, did you not? None at all. And no one else had any idea either. I, I'd done quite well in the CCF, the officers' training, which you have, have to do at school. They would thought I was military material, and so on my report, which I think I still have somewhere, they said probably he should go into the paratroop regiment or something. Um, nothing could be further from my desires. I, I put in the magazine, I think, to histrionic, everyone was saying, you know, to Cambridge, to Oxford, to Sandhurst, and I put <laughs> to histrionic art. I wasn't quite sure what histrionic <laughs> art was, but I'd read it somewhere, and I thought, well, that'll fill in that gap. Um, but really, I didn't know, and I left, and I went and did social work in South London. In Peckham, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Peckham and Camberwell. Did you enjoy that? I did, I loved it. It knocked a lot of the stuffing out of me, which was good for me. Having been privately educated, it taught me what real life was about and how you had to deal with real people and how, what, you know, what they required and what people's problems were. But I found I wasn't selfless enough. I wanted to become involved with the people and their problems that I was trying to sort out. And I was told by, from all quarters that you must keep absolute dispassionate. Um, and I wasn't able to do that. I wanted a real communication. And so I, I knew that I was, as I say, not selfless enough to continue in that line, although I did enjoy it and I learned a huge amount. And while I did it, I was paid practically nothing, although given free board and lodging. I, uh, I would cycle with my guitar up to the West End of London and, and busk to the cinema queues. I know. We're in the heart of the West End and cinema land and theatre land, and you used to come here then on a bike mm. uh, and sing to the crowds. I did. I would <laughs> make my pitch, as people probably still do today, and uh, open my guitar case and get to the, hopefully, the head of a cinema queue and start singing. And as people came by, they gave me the odd pence, the odd five pence, the odd shilling as it was then. And uh, I could earn about five pounds a queue, and I was being paid for spending money two pounds ten shillings a week, which is two pounds fifty. Um, so to earn five pounds in forty minutes was very good. But of course there was a great hierarchy there, and and people would set up their pitches way in advance and would always play the same pitch night after night. And so I was a bit of an interloper, and I had to fill in the gaps. I had to find pitches where people hadn't turned up. Uh, very often I would be singing and nothing would be going in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the guitar case and I would discover that just round the corner, sort of some ten yards away further up the queue, there was someone else doing it and he was taking all the money and he was, he was always there. It taught me to, 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 to sing quite loudly because in, for some of the cinemas there were a lot of traffic nearby. Did that sort of help your confidence in a way? Was it a good confidence booster singing in front of sort of cinema crowds? Or it not really? was in a way. It was a great way to pick up girls. <laughs> great way. I, I travelled over Europe busking. And, and Did you? I, I never really learned how to, uh, how to introduce myself to the opposite sex. Uh, I had a huge desire to, as one does at that age, when the hormones are buzzing around. <laughs> um, but I, I wasn't very good at doing it without being totally sort of crapulous of how, as how I was doing it so, but I found that sitting and singing beautiful things would come and sit beside you and you'd get to know them which was, which was nice you lucky chap yes. <laughs> I know your father said to you he would pay until you were about 21 if you wanted to go into acting I think that was mm. his sort of general idea wasn't it? Well yeah he said when I, when I said I think I want to become an actor he, he, 
he was very kind and said, well, you better try it if you think you want to try it or you'll resent me for not supporting you. But um, I don't think it's a very secure profession and don't expect anything from me after you're 21, which, is, which would have been about when I came out of drama school. He said, I'll pay your fees, but I won't pay your living expenses, so you'll have to earn. And I worked as a builder to, uh, to earn those, built, putting on lavatories onto the back of people's semi-detached houses. That wasn't Domestics Unlimited, was that later? No, that was later. Domestics was Unlimited was once I'd been through theatre school and, and, uh, and through my time at Bristol, which is where I did my first three years as an actor, and then I came to London to, so to speak, make a name for myself or try to. And uh, while I was auditioning and, and trying to get roles, I worked for a domestics agency. I kept body and soul together that way. What did Dad say when he <laughs> said, what are you doing? And you said, I'm a plumber. Was he not too impressed? Or? No, he was... I, my father was the sort of man um, who was impressed if I was paying my rent and, <laughs> and, and eating enough. He didn't, you know... As long as I wouldn't come to him and ask for a handout, he was happy. But you were glad you went to the Bristol Old Vic. It was great training for you, really, wasn't it? It was good training, yeah. I made a lot of friends. It was a very happy time. Bristol is a wonderful city um, and has the great advantage of being a great city and also being very near the country. Um, and for me, it was my university years, so to speak. And uh, after the two-year course at the theatre school, going down to the company and working there with professional actors for three years and beginning to play leading roles myself was, was a great way to start out. I'm Vanilla Fielding, and whenever I can, I listen to John Hannah meets. <laughs> what a bonus today, Catherine Cusack, Jeremy Irons, and a touch of Vanilla Fielding. Incidentally, the Jeremy Irons archive was recorded back in 1999 at the Theatre Royal Haymarket. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio.